Thanks again for joining us and welcome back to Talking Leadership. By way of introduction, my guest today is the president of CDANS, which is an acronym for the Career Development Association of New Zealand, which is the sister organization of the CDAA, which is the Career Development Association of Australia. Can I welcome to the podcast, Heather Lowry Kappas? How are you, mate? I'm great. Thank you. Thank you for joining me, mate. Look, Again, offline, we talked about the reason for being here and that I have a a great affinity for and respect for what you guys do as professionals in the career development space. But me being a curious fellow and wanting to link up what I have an interest in, which is leadership, I I think there's a a marriage made in heaven there and I want to explore that a little bit. But before we do, um, the podcast is about your leadership experiences. So let's start at the beginning, your leadership and, and where did it begin? I think that it it began quite early. I think it probably came out of actually working and being put in positions where you are in charge as as such. So you're leading a team or you're leading. So when I first came out of high school, I worked in hospitality. I'm a trained chef. So kitchens and then it went into managerial roles in restaurants and bars. And so I guess it came from there, from being put in charge of other people in a work context. And I guess has kind of morphed into other things. I think I'm quite action orientated, so I get a bit frustrated when um, nothing's happening, and so I just kind of make myself <laughs> into the into the okay, let's get this done kind of person, and so naturally that makes makes you means that you step up into that leadership role without necessarily really wanting to do it. Interesting on a couple of fronts. So I, I consider myself, I'm only speaking for me, that I'm a classically introverted type of person. With what you explained there, would you consider yourself an introvert or an extrovert? And before you answer, do you think that links into this need to be action oriented? Interesting. From a career development perspective, I know that I'm an introvert, but I know that most people think I'm an extrovert. And I think it's because I think introversion and extroversion is kind of, we've put that into introverts are shy, extroverts are outgoing, but actually introverts just get their energy from internal, okay? And extroverts get their energy from other people. And I think that doesn't necessarily mean, I think some of the best leaders of introverts because they think about things before they do them and they know why they're doing something before they do it. It's an amazing response. I would have picked you as a classic extrovert. And yeah, I, I agree with the distinction is not about, it's about where you draw your energy. And I'm, I'm very much, I don't need a million people around me to get uh, to get my energy and get started. However, that doesn't mean I'm a loner. It doesn't mean I'm a hermit. I, I love my family. I love to be around people, but I can compartmentalize when that's appropriate and when it's not. But like you, I've and you probably have friends friends that are like this. I know people professionally and in my non work life that extroversion doesn't quite cover it for them. Like they, if they're not around people, they're not. A fully realized human being and I'm like really like you can't have any downtime when it's just you yeah. and they're like no my, my brain needs others around and I think part of that is uh, people in that extrovert end of the spectrum like to bounce ideas even even if the idea doesn't go anywhere just to throw something yes. out there whereas I can't do that shit I can't I can't myself go I'm going to share some ideas with you I have to think about it test it in my head what are the consequences of me opening my mouth it, it's it's a hard way to live if you a, a, a classic uh, introvert, but I wouldn't have picked you, Heather, for uh, an oh, introvert. I got to say, well, if you people around me will tell you that um, I have a particular colleague who also says, always says, back up, back up. Okay, where did that come from? Because you started halfway halfway through that, and I'm thinking, yeah, it was all in my head, and then I just spat out the bit that I, and they're like, I don't know where you came, you know, so I have to back up and kind of tell her the process, which. Sometimes I forget that other people haven't heard that process because I've done it internally and got to this the space or this idea and I'm quite future focused I think I'm quite strategic and future focused and so I might have amalgamated 10 different ideas and mulled them for a week but then I just go oh and then people are like where does that come from (laughs) yeah it's um it's fascinating like you endlessly fascinating to work out where people started careers and when you said you started out as a chef in some ways that didn't surprise me, but in others, in that world of being a chef, it's quite 
uh, and I'm talking outside of looking in and I'm not saying all chefs are like this, but I get, I have to try and get out of my head the celebrity chefs like your Gordon Ramsay's. I think it's the environment in which chefs and people in hospitality work that pro- probably shapes the kind of leaders that they're going to be. And I, I would I would put to you that uh, people in the in the hospitality game probably don't suffer fools lightly because you've got to get things done quickly, make decisions yep. quickly because you're dealing with providing a service and recreation to other people where you're, whereas you're doing a job while other people are having their downtime. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, and you see the best and the worst of people. So in terms of you see the best behaviour and the worst behaviour of people from the front of the house and the back of the house. And so I think you learn pretty quickly what how people operate, um, the different things they do um, and stuff like that to get things done. Um, and you learn very quickly how to navigate some of those real complicated issues like complaint handling and things like that, that sometimes people don't come up against very often. But in hospitality, you come up against it on a daily basis you come up against prejudice you come up against people who are just downright rude because they're having a bad day you have to learn to not internalize insults all sorts of things that I think that kind of stand you in quite good stead with dealing with people and working with people collaboratively because it happens you know back in the kitchen too because you get do get the loud people who are quite outgoing and then you get the introverted people you do get the pop bangers and the swearers like the Gordon Ramsay's and things like that and then you get the quiet you know just hard working get the job done people so I think you just get the full mix and that's a re- it is a really good environment to learn. I think, hosp- you know, anybody who's worked in hospitality, even if they hated it, will agree that they learned a lot of skills from it, particularly when dealing with people and how to deal with people in different ways. Yeah, I, I, I had a, 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 f- a flittering glimpse of what that world was like when I, when I was in end of my high schooling days. I, I took on a contract that my dad got me at a hotel, being a, a houseman at a hotel. The hotel was not too bad, but it was just doing those odd jobs that nobody else wanted to do. And to see how all the different groups interacted and front of house versus back of house and what it meant to be working when other people were at leisure. It's just, it's, it's a weird but interesting interesting space and I think it it and I can agree with you on this fully that it helps you to understand people a little better and if we can agree maybe that leadership is about understanding people then it goes a long way if leadership is something that you're interested in following as part of your career pathway whatever that might look like so in in that vein how do you define leadership Heather? That's a really big big kind of question to me to lead is just it's almost like being the project manager and so whatever project you're you're doing you're you're kind of like the project manager of that so you're not necessarily the doer but you're the person who maybe pulls everybody together and gets them excited about what they're doing and is able to perhaps you know kind of troubleshoot to make Make sure that the other people who are doing the work um, are able to do it as well as possible. So it may be smoothing pathways for them. It may be making sure they have the right resources. It might just um, be advocating for the space for them and things like that. So I, I guess to me, that's how I see it. I see it more as a kind of, you know, leader for me means project manager, really. And I, it just means that I've got multiple little projects going on within a big project. I like the analogy there because you're you're trying to marshal the resources of others to get something done, which is part of um, project management. So yeah, okay, I, I, it's a different way to put it. I, I, I haven't heard it put that way, but that there is the beauty of this is that there is no right and wrong. And in in some respects, I, I can see where you're coming from with that. If you're into project management methodologies, which I'm not, but I understand what they are, that the management and good timing of your resources and typically in leadership roles, it's about people that you're getting your jobs done, whatever that set of jobs looks like. Um, But in that process, I guess, Heather, there is a need for leaders to be making decisions and 
make no claims to owning the following term, but this this idea of a lonely road of leadership that at the end of the day, you're making decisions and ultimately you're, you have to own the decisions that you make. Do you think it is a lonely road or is it as lonely as you make it? Yeah, I think it's as lonely as you make it. And I think that from my perspective, working for the association, we are membership association. So we're not making that those decisions by ourselves. We are making them with uh, either with in consultation with the members or using the national our full national executive to make those decisions. So I feel like most of the decisions aren't totally mine. We have a plan of action and a kind of a vision and a strategic goal. And so within there, yes, there's some decisions that I can make, but they're still tied into that. And I still would have to, in my head, have the rationale about well, I did that because of that. It wouldn't just be, well, I just decided to go on this path and everybody else didn't know about it. Um, so I, I do think that, but I do think that there, you know, you could be a leader that just says, right, I'm autocratic and this is the way we're doing it and, you know, you follow me, but it's not my style at all. And I don't think I've ever been a 100% like that because I don't believe that I know all the answers or that I'm the expert of everything. And so um, I guess from a career development perspective, I believe everybody's the expert of themselves. And so I guess I bring that into my leadership as well, that, that kind of idea that, you know, everybody is an expert of something and I can't be the expert of everything. So I've got to delegate and I've got to give up and I don't know the answers to everything. And I, I have had my mind changed and I've also led projects that I felt that I wasn't a hundred percent sure that I thought that that was the right path, but it was the path that was chosen by the full committee and the membership. The subtlety there about working with a with a committee and a board and being the president or the the chair of a board that you've got collegiate decision making. It's not just one person's view of the world. I I get that. I in my day to day job, I work to a board as a CEO, but I, I've never held a president's role in an organisation. So I'm sort of the next run down trying to feed information up to help the powers that be make um, make good decisions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I still think as a president that you, as, as I stepped into the role, there were some things that I thought needed to happen and maybe projects that I maybe push forward before other projects and things like that. So I do think in that way, I have led some work within the association that perhaps another president wouldn't have. So I do think you kind of go into some of those roles with some ideas of what about what needs to be done and you pick and kind of do mold a little bit in the way the pathway or the way that those things are going to be presented to the members to look at. So I still think you do have a little bit of influence there. The question I wanted to ask while I've got you is Given that you work with a group of professional people, do you think your community of practice works in that collegiate type way, wants to work collectively to get outcomes, or do you feel uh, career development practitioners are very much solo, in, uh, strong individualists? Like, where, where would you, could you group your industry as more collegiate or more independent minded? I think we work independently, and but we're very collegiate, and I think we share a lot, and I think we're very good at um, um, supporting and um, collaborating with each other, but we are, by nature of our work, because we work with clients, individuals, and because of, you know, where we might work, we work quite, our individual work can be quite separate, and maybe that makes us more collegial, but I think it also because of the nature of career development, we know that we can't be that so big and so broad and so varied that you can't necessarily be the expert of everything. So you also kind of tend to specialise a little in your kind of area of practice. And so you do kind of look for the people that you see doing great work in other areas of practice so that you can refer and things like that. So I know in my community, we do a lot of referrals to different people, like somebody might come to me for some expertise, and I think, oh, no, I'm not the right person, this person would be better, and I would refer them on and things like that. That's, that's consistent with what I know of the career development community in Queensland, or the people that I yeah. know that work in, in your field uh, here in Oz. Yeah, that, that's interesting. So 
from your experience as a professional person as, and as a leader, I want to talk to you a bit, if I can, around leader capabilities. Now, I have a personal view of what, what I think are, are critical to an effective leader. They're not, it's not mine, it's not an exhaustive list, as in I could have a thousand things, but I think there are some core things that make for effective leadership. But again, this is about you. So do you have a sense of what capabilities for you are critical? I think for me, it's one, I have to be passionate about it because I think I am kind of a reluctant leader. I really only want to leave things that I'm interested in and I want to do because otherwise I'd rather, you know, I am an introvert, so I'd rather not. So I think that that, that passion is really important. And I think it's also really important for that kind of motivation and, and being able to motivate and inspire others. You know, when you're asking other people to do things um, if you're not that interested in it it's going to be kind of hard right I'm the other thing I think is the ability to delegate I'm very much you can't do everything and I think a good leader has to realize that they can't do everything and has to be able to delegate and or find expertise elsewhere for the things that they're not good at so I think also a little quite a lot of self-knowledge and knowing what you're good at and what you're not great at and being able to admit to it and stick to it as well not all of a sudden decide that you're oh no I could do that um, <laughs> um, so I think that delegation and that kind of it goes hand in hand with knowing yourself really well enough to be able to say well I you know I need an expert for this or I need to delegate this because this isn't me and I also think you have to have delegation also comes with that kind of lens of not micromanaging as well so being able to give up that yeah that bit because micromanaging actually means that you you're, you're still doing everything <laughs> yeah you're just doing doing it by another name <laughs> yeah um, no yeah. I, I agree the ability to fall into that trap is um not you know micromanagement's not a good it's not a good thing for anyone so yeah no i yeah wholeheartedly agree can i ask you the the next topic area is one that i've, I've continually have an interest in because although i have a i've had a run of of typical responses i always ask this of all my guests the nature versus nurture question so are leaders born or are they made heather i think as you know i think that's a bit of both i think that that you will have and i and i do think it has to do with whether people are interested so i think you kind of are first motivated by your interest in something and wanting to get something done and then or, or wanting to be able to work with people or something like that and then you refine the skill as you go along and you do it is a little bit of trial and error um, a little bit of growth a bit of, bit of self-knowledge because I guess people don't follow you if you're not good at it and so you might start out being oh yeah I'm all enthusiastic to be a leader but if you don't refine it and get better at it people stop following you so I guess that's why I'm saying a bit of both because I think you can have that natural ability and want but actually then you actually have to refine it because after a while people stop following you and I think what I'm thinking about you know you had those people in high school or in primary school that were you know always the top gog or the you know the top of the pile and always got picked as the captain for everything and stuff like that but they weren't necessarily the people in high school and they weren't necessarily the people who were managers or something as you went into the workforce were they but then other people rose up but some of those people who stepped forward did end up being the managers and the leaders later on so yeah I th that's where I get it from I kind of can see that and that you know natural charisma does come into it initially at least um, but if you've got no skill in it nobody's going to follow you <laughs> agreed agreed charisma can only take you so far because I, I think uh, the substance of your ability to lead is going to come out fairly quickly so you can only dazzle people for a certain amount of time before they go well where's the substance here I think I think that's what you're getting at Heather look when I do this as a bit of a high casting exercise so looking back at your own leadership pathway what would you say to a younger version of yourself about being a more effective leader wow I think delegate more don't take things so personally stick to your vision yeah I think those were probably the, the three things I think as you get older you get a little less worried 
about whatever other what other people are thinking about you as you're doing doing what you're doing and so that that feeds into all three of those things I have to agree and, and maybe it's a nature of being an introvert but I'm at a point in my career life that I couldn't give a flying hoo-ha what people think about me I really don't care and I, that's e- easier to say now because I've lived some life but ask me when I was in my 20s or in my teens you care a lot what other people think and I reckon for those that want leadership roles as a career pathway a good bit of advice when you're young is don't worry about other people worry about what you're doing and whether or not you can have a positive effect on others on the come up also what you believe in I think if you don't believe in what you're doing then then don't do it like and I think there are times when you might be asked to be a leader in something that you just don't believe in and so there are times when it's not not a good choice to be a leader in those places like actually walking away is the leadership that you should do um yeah because I think that sometimes people see leadership as just a like oh you know I want to be a leader and I'm going to be a leader of anything but there are some things you just don't because you have value you know you couldn't have your vision and your values have to sit in there and your ethics and your integrity and stuff like that as well and I think if you bring all those to your leadership then you know that's probably another good name for your your charisma actually it's um it's quite insightful i think making decision not to do something can be as powerful as making decision to do that thing so yeah no i agreed heather look i appreciate your time uh before we go see dan's what do you do and um i will put links to your organization on the podcast description obviously but tell us a bit about CDANS and what you do. So CDANS is the Career Development Association of New Zealand. It's the national membership body for career development professionals who work in Aotearoa New Zealand and we work across both the islands um, up down and both sides I always say and we work with people in uh, we have careers advisors in schools and private practice and tertiary uh, working in vocational rehab it's about developing and or helping people to develop their careers and make those successful transitions into further education and out of further education and also to make transitions uh, later on in life whether that be into new roles new occupations or maybe into retirement you know how you're going to transition into retirement has become a really big thing lately so it's kind of across the spectrum of careers delves into the counseling coaching areas but also into the just the practical components like how to have a LinkedIn and uh, you know what you should put in your CV, how you should write a cover letter, prepping you for your interviews, thinking about what your strengths and weaknesses are, where you want to develop. So it's quite broad. It's one of the things that I love about it. No two days are the same. And I, I love it too, because while it's counselling, and I am a trained counsellor, it is a hopeful counsellor process, um, because I, I believe that, you know, there's always hope even if you have come to a lot you know something in your life and you're not able to carry on with something you love there will always be an aspect of that that you can take forward and some of the skills that you developed into something new and it's just the national association thank you heather i appreciate that again thank you for your time and for those listening thank you for following talking leadership we'll catch everyone on the next podcast